We're delighted to have everybody with us here again. Um, and uh, this is our, gosh, one, two, three, four session, I suppose. And our second of the of a, a trio of Roan sessions we have. Today's session is called It Takes a Village. Um, not so much a page out of uh, Hillary Clinton, but more out of the sense of it takes a village and that there are many village or village or villages that make up the, the Cote de Rhone. And that whole purpose on the session today is to focus about that. We are uh, fortunate to be joined by um, our fearless leaders uh, from north of the border here in, in uh, the United States. And that would be John Zabo. John, just say hi real quick. Hello. Sarah D'Amato, also from Canada. Hello. Say hi there. And I'm gonna turn it over to them momentarily uh, to do that. I'm sure, I hope a lot of you are excited. I know I am. I know there have been a bit of distractions in the last couple of days of various sorts. Um, most recently, um, I think Georgia is on the mind of a number of people out there um, amongst other places too. But I just want everybody to, to, to take their brains out and put their hearts and souls into their own today. I know I have, I thought I, I dressed appropriately for the, for the day. I hope you did as well too. Um, oh, nice. But uh, we're going to we're going to have a nice thing. And without that, John, let's go ahead and start. Let me give the housekeeping, get that all done so we can give it to uh, to all of y'all. So um, if, for those of you who are with us, indulge, who have been with us before, indulge me. For those of you who are new, um, this is for you. Uh, all of the programs that we're doing are based on a online platform called Thinkific on which our Zoom interface lives, as you've probably figured it out already or you wouldn't be here right now. Um, each session can be automatically connected live uh, by clicking on the live session uh, element here, which is the third or fourth button down that you would have seen on the right here. Uh, that gets you into the live sessions, et cetera. There is a, a prep session, a, a prep area ahead of time, which we always encourage people to look at in the seminar overview and prep, as importantly for reminders on the wines, kit numbers, but also important because we don't uh, spend um, ample time going through people's illustrious biographies, that that's a really good place to learn about our speakers, winemakers, panelists, et cetera. Uh, we encourage people um, to join us not only for the session, but we always have our happy hour or actually happy half hour right afterwards so we can community engage, ask additional questions along the fly, et cetera. The cute little giraffe next to tech support is to remind me, to remind you that if your usual browser um, is Safari, uh, we have had a few Safari issues with tech specifically pertaining to audio. And if you're having that problem, you might wanna go out and come back again through Chrome or um, Firefox or whatever your secondary browser might be. Um, please support our program by obviously staying engaged and all that, but there are surveys as you can see here um, to answer questions and provide information back to our various uh, winemakers and trade associations and all that. And um, the, tech, the, the tech sheets are all available too in that bottom uh, particular uh, thing. So everything lives in Thinkific. All right, let's move on from there. Next. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you can learn. As I said before, even if you don't have the wines today, you can learn without them. So there's gonna be as much here as not. Frankly, most of us are used to spending our Zoom time without wine. So it's really just a value add if you have them. There'll be tremendous information available uh, all the time. The chat boxes you are all well aware of for hellos and community hugs, expression, all that. Please make sure that you are selecting all panelists and attendees in order to make sure that everybody can see your comments because if not, it's just the panelists who can and we're on a lot of times so when we're not doing. So I mentioned at the very outset while we were waiting for you to join us, but I will reiterate it now. If uh, one can't be to either, well, obviously if you're here live in this session now, but to access recordings uh, in the past or recordings moving forward for sessions that you can't join us in uh, person, please make uh, use of that uh, feature on the Thinkific thing. And uh, I need not tell you all to be prompt uh, because we have been starting and we have been finishing on time. So many, many thanks to that. Next slide, Monsieur. Um, about the wines, many of you do have the wines in front of you today for our, our, our kit. Um, for those of you um, who do not, you might have them for a future kit, uh, depending on how you signed up. And um, if not, you can learn anyway. But if you do have the wines, I always encourage people to start early, uh, either at a bare minimum uh, by opening the wines up before you got into the session, not on the fly. Ideally, so you can taste them earlier, a little bit earlier in the day, in a perfect world the day before. Uh, it, particularly if you wanna make use of our online interface at, at, at mtwwines.com that allows you to track the wines and see um, how they're scoring, how they're rating out, et cetera. For those of you who are really using this as, a, as the education tool for which it was, um, there is a leaderboard which you can enter. Many of you are already there under 608L, which you can find under the group, which is just under the, uh, 
the, the taste and reveal page after you've entered your code. For those of you who are engaging, I just want to um, remind those uh, and tell those who don't know that with each session that has wine in it, uh, the three worm sessions and some of the others, um, that we will do a drawing for people that have uh, participated. And the winning prize will be a Master of the World Future Wine Kit, an individual kit. And then the two uh, runner-up prizes will be um, a subscription to SOM TV for three months. We appreciate our product sponsors joining us. Uh, and they will also get, oh, I'm sorry, the, they all get that. Uh, and then the two runners-up get a cop copy of the Master's uh, the blinders card game. Now, obviously, if you don't have the wines, you're not going to be able to participate there. But if you participate in this session and all the sessions, everybody, wined or not, will be in um, the drawing for a annual subscription to Master the World. That's a full 12 months that we will pick a winner for, for people who have engaged through all of the kits, once again, either live or after the fact. And finally, I think that's about all I've got to say. But John, if you want to get the slide, I'll either turn it over to you, which is about what I'm going to do. It gives me great pleasure. Uh, and it's a real privilege to have um, a, a team of winemaking talent and wine knowledge talent there. Uh, we're going to be led today by uh, John Sabo and Sarah D'Amato, joined by several vintners. And on that note, I'm going to shut myself down. I'll come back and join you all at the end. And I'm going to hand it off to John and Sarah. Evan, thank you very much. Thorough and professional as ever. And you know what, uh, a huge thank you for giving us a, this welcome distraction on an afternoon, believe it or not, up here in Canada, we are on the, on, on the edge of our seats as well. And what better way to not think about it than to inhale the sense of the Southern Rhone and taste some beautiful wines. And on that note, by sheer miracle, Evan and his team managed to get his Master of the World kit across the notoriously tight Canadian border. Thank you for that olive oil, by the way, it is delicious. Uh, so Sarah and I will be able to taste along with our winemakers. Before I uh, finish up the introductions, I'd like to turn it over to Sabine Delba from Interrone, who's going to say a few words of greetings. Greetings, Sabine, all the way from near Avignon, correct? That's correct. A little village called Bédarid next to Avignon. So I'm the export marketing manager for Enterron. Enterron is actually um, the wine syndicate that promotes the Rhone Valley vineyards, meaning that um, I represent 5,000 winemakers and wine merchants. Uh, so today we're going to focus on the Côte du Rhone village. Uh, I'm hoping a few of you have already been here, um, here for the first seminar and that you enjoyed. Um, today, you're going to see more Côte du Rhône village and Côte du Rhône village with a geographical names. Just so you know, um, you, you should have um, these material that can help you to, to know more about the region. In the encyclopedia, you'll see you have 21 village because a new one just came. Um, so we now have 22 um, Côte du Rhône villages that can put their names after the, the Côte du Rhône, so it's great. Uh, today you're going to learn about the diversity, the richness of the terroir crafted by the Rhône River. You'll see multiple grapes um, and um, you are going to be very lucky because some winemakers from the Rhône are going to talk about their stories and introduce them uh, to their wines. So thank you for, for all of them. I also want to thank you, John and Sarah and Ivan for being here today and organizing uh, this beautiful seminar. Um, thank you so much. I'm hoping you're gonna have a great learning session and for the luckiest one, a great tasting. Have fun and thank you very much. Merci Sabine. Thank you very much. All right, let me introduce my co-host here, Sarah D'Amato. She's a colleague, wine writer of mine at winealign.com. She's also my uh, co-host of the podcast, Wine Thieves, which we recently launched. And more importantly, Sarah has a family home down in Avignon. So she has spent many, many, many weeks on the ground, pretty much every summer. You spend most of the summer there, other than this past summer, for obvious reasons. But uh, she is my ace in the hole. She is the expert with boots on the ground who has uh, traveled to this region countless times, knows so many winemakers, and will really be able to share the flavor of the Rhone. I have been to the Rhone Valley on a few occasions, but uh, certainly don't have nearly the depth of experience that Sarah has. And we will also be welcoming Anthony Taylor from Gabriel Meffre, and Maud Autrin from Domaine Piaget, Thibaut Brot from Maison Brot, and Stéphane Vedo from La Ferme du Mont, Clos Bellan. We will 
bring them in as their wines come up and uh, we've pre-prepped them with some questions about the specifics of the villages because I think this is going to be quite a fascinating seminar. Uh, I know you're all professionals out there, you know lots about the Rhone Valley north and south, but I think it's fair to say, certainly in Canada, I think also down in the United States, that uh, the awareness of the very large differences within the Cotillon village and those geographic named villages is really quite substantial and uh, you know what I'm still learning about it we are discovering the unique characteristics of so many of these of these wines and that's what we're going to focus on today. Sarah do you have any uh, words of welcome before we jump right in? Yes, um, thank you so much for joining us we're really thrilled to actually be able to be here even though our borders are closed we're, uh, we're at least able to get to you virtually. And um, I'm so thrilled to be with this esteemed group of uh, producers here. And I think we're gonna give you a real flavor and, and a real sense the best we can uh, of the region, of the aromas and uh, certainly of the landscape. So thank you and welcome. Brilliant, okay, let's jump right in. I wanna get a few salient facts and figures out of the way, just kind of paint the background details. I know those of you who were tuned in last week will have seen, heard similar information. And as evidence had been mentioned, you've got this beautiful resource here. So uh, ease, ease your minds. All of the information that I'm gonna be flashing up on the screen is, is easily retrievable in the book or online. So you don't have to be there scribbling away furiously trying to get some notes down. All right, so the Rhone Valley, you all know where it is, it's a, it's a very large valley. It starts up in Switzerland and rolls all the way down to the Mediterranean. The part that interests us, the, uh, the, the Rhone Valley in the wine sense in France, it's about 150 miles north to south. That's from Vienne all the way down to uh, just around Avignon. It's a comfortable three hour drive or so. And I really encourage you, if you have the opportunity, when we have the opportunity to do that drive, to drive from north to south. Don't take the Autoroute du Sud, that's the big superhighway that kind of misses all of the, uh, the points of interest along the way. But if you take some of the secondary routes, one that, that goes right down by the Rhone River, you will notice what a dramatic difference there is between the north and the south. And we all consider it one region, but it's really two quite separate regions and you'll see that from the north with those very very steep slopes carved out of granite when you pass Monte Limal the sort of uh, the midway point you could say between north and south you suddenly open up into this much vaster more undulating open landscape the light changes the scents change a little bit gets a little bit warmer and uh, you know you really feel like you are in southern France at that point. Sarah's going to tell us a little bit more about that. But uh, just to enhance the uh, discussion of difference, a little bit of geology, if you will allow me. Sarah, you know that I love to talk talk geology, but you know the north and the south, it's not just topographic differences. It's, um, it's a completely different geology. Very briefly, the Rhone Valley is what uh, geologists call a rift valley. So that was created in between the Massif Central, big chain of mountains right in the center of France, very, very close to the Northern Rhone and the Alps. So as tectonic action occurred, plates pulled apart, a rift valley was formed and that allowed the Mediterranean to actually um, flow inland. So that's the origins of the Rhone River. Now the source is of course in the Alps in Switzerland and it does flow down to the Mediterranean. That Massif Central I mentioned, that is the result of volcanic activity, which explains why in Northern Rhone, you have almost uh, homogeneous pure granite. Granite is an intrusive igneous rock, which is a fancy way of saying it is uh, hardened lava, but lava that hardened under the surface. So not technically lava, just hardened magma. Whereas uh, down in the South, what you have is uh, essentially sedimentation from that sea as it flowed in all those millions of years ago. So your base geology there is limestone. But then of course, millions of years of the Rhone River itself, bringing down alluvial material deposited all over the place, sand, gravels, those famous galets roulés, the stones that you see in, in pictures of Chateauneuf du Pape vineyards and elsewhere. So it really becomes a lot more varied depending on the course of the river over the millennia, depositing here, then shifting its course and depositing there, carving through some of those limestone outcrops like the Dentelle de, de Montmirail and Mont Ventoux. The cyclists out there will be familiar with that. That rather rigorous mountain, that's part of the Tour de France every year and that's one hell of a climb. Let me tell you, it, <laughs> it's a long way. I can't remember how many kilometers, but uh, grueling 
grueling stuff. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about the geology, just to reinforce the fact that the Southern Rhone is really quite varied. So other influences, well, elevation, we're gonna be talking a little bit about that. We're not talking massive differences in elevation, but there are some vineyards that are down around just a few hundred feet above sea level to some that rise up to uh, four or 500 meters. So in, in American, that would be what, 1500 feet or so somewhere in that range. So that's enough to make a big difference for a great vine. We'll taste some wines from lower down, we'll taste some wines from higher up. So you get a sense of how elevation impacts. And then there is of course the famous Mistral. Sarah, is the Mistral your friend or your enemy? In the summer, it's definitely everybody's friend. This is a really, really hot region. And you know, I think if places further south than this is maybe being warmer, but that's where everybody goes to cool off. So the Mistral is a lifesaver during the summer months when it is incredibly hot because it can actually bring down the temperature several degrees. It is howling though, and you have to keep your shutters closed and all that beautiful sunshine uh, doesn't get in, but neither does all that dust. So, uh, so certainly yes, in the summer, your friend in the winter, it gets cold and nasty with the Mistral. So you better be during the growing season yeah, to, to enjoy the mitral. So it's a, it's a friend and enemy depending on when and, and for what reason for grape growers. It's a, it's a great friend, as you mentioned in the summer, not to cool, just to cool things down, but also to really dry out those vineyards after the rare rains that you experience down in that part of the world. But that is obviously terrific for the health of the grape vines and, and the canopy itself, which uh, is a long, goes a long way to explain the high percentage of organic vineyards in the Southern Rhone. Uh, you know, I, I, there are winemakers on this call. I will never make the statement that it's easy to make wine uh, anywhere on the planet. But you know, I have to say down in the Southern Rhone, it's, uh, it's a pretty comfortable place to live. Also for a grapevine to grow, abundant sunshine, uh, a rain, just enough when you need it. And uh, the possibility to really do minimal impact farming, if not full on organic sustainable. You know, sustainability is not really part of the Rhone uh, dialogue agenda. We don't really associate those two, but that's simply because they've been doing it for almost ever because they can, you know, compared to other parts of the world. I've, I've got a place in a region called Prince Edward County where, let me tell you what, it's, it's a hellish place to make wine. You've got to bury your vines in the winter and in the summer. If it's if it's not freezing cold, then it's hot and humid and uh, a tough place to make organic wine in any case. Certainly very few challenges here that way in terms of rot and mold, given the sunshine and wind. Right, so uh, maybe another surprising stat for those who haven't looked into it, 34 grape varieties. I know we think of the, of the main ones and those trip off the tongue, Grenache, Syrah, Morvedre, the famous GSM blend, but there are quite a few more secondary grapes that grow throughout the region that uh, allow for the little spicings, the little difference. And that also increases the diversity, not just the terroir, not just the elevation, but also the particular blend employed by a producer across uh, 31 appellations. You can see the breakdown there. We know it's mainly red wine country, although there is uh, of course rosé production and a little splash of white here and there. And I have to say, I'm a big fan of, of Rhone whites more on that in a moment. The, uh, the varieties should be covered, maybe just some, some basic characteristics. Again, I know you're all pros in the business, but uh, let's take Grenache as the starting point, very important variety. This is uh, a great for me, which usually presents more in the red fruit spectrum, very, very ripe. You know, you won't find much Grenache under 13, 13 half percent. It's simply not ripe below that, and it hasn't fully developed its aromatic potential, which is significant. Uh, so you would expect a rather voluptuous, round, creamy texture. Acid is not particularly high, uh, so generous alcohol and all these heady red fruits, strawberry, strawberry pie, strawberry jam, cherries, cherries in Ode B, that sort of character. Syrah, we know for its, its pepperiness, rotundo, to put the technical term on it, but yes, it can be very peppery, black pepper, white pepper, but also floral, especially in some of those cooler parts of the Southern Rhone, and uh, with its own structure, much deeper color than uh, Grenache does. If you have a pure Grenache, very likely going to be in the pale garnet spectrum, put in some Syrah, whatever percentage, and you will deepen the color, turn it back towards the purple spectrum. Same thing with Mourvedre, other principal grape down there, famous for its uh, gamey, uh, almost savage, wild 
character uh, turning into truffles and forest floor and old leather as it gets older, but also quite a structured variety, lots of tannins, quite deep color. So, I mean, those are your, are your main stays, saint -So, probably most famous in the roses of the Rhone Valley, also, of course, down in Provence. It's a drought resistant, fairly late ripening variety, uh, producing lighter, elegant wines. So that's why it's so perfect with the, uh, with the rosé range. Sarah, do you want to weigh in on, uh, on some of the white varieties, Grenache, Viognier, Marsan? Which do you prefer, Marsan or Roussan? Well, it depends on if you're talking about the Northern Rhone or the Southern Rhone, right? Um, I We're talking only Southern Rhone here today. This is I know, awesome. I know. So that's where, <laughs> that's where it is. But um, certainly in the, the context of the Southern Rhone, um, I think there's some really great old vineyards of Roussan that are quite remarkable. So they're, they're pretty captivating. Um, but Marsan in terms of aromatics is something to me that, uh, that I think is quite beautiful. So it's a bit of a toss up. So yeah, there are um, many white varieties, just as there are red varieties, fewer, and certainly the amount of white wine that's produced there is, is quite small as well. But Grenache Blanc certainly is one of uh, one of my favorites, as uh, as well as Viognier. But Grenache Blanc. Um, really is a, a very expressive variety and I, I feel that it really uh, showcases terroir quite well and um, it, it certainly expresses itself in, in a fresh fashion even when it's planted in warmer areas, uh, lovely aromatics and has that, uh, and I know you'll talk about saline a lot, John, or at least I'll expect you to mention it at least once, uh, but a certain crunchiness and saltiness about it um, that uh, that you often find in the Southern Rhone with those types of varieties. And of course, Viognier being more, more voluptuous and the more Viognier involved, the more voluptuous it is, but it isn't such a major player the way that it is in, in the North. Brilliant, thank you for that little recap. And uh, I have to just add that one of those transformative wines, one of those wines that, that changed my life, was uh, the Beaucastel Vieille Vine Roussan, that old vine Roussan Cuvée from, from uh, Beaucastel, which was just an absolute spectacular wine. If you can get your hands on that, do, because it is the essence of Roussan. Uh, this uh, is a little photo of, I just wanted to show again, a little bit of the geology. We're in the Southern Rhone now, so it, it is, it's not flat, but uh, it's not like the Northern Rhone, more undulating, but you do get these outcrops, these spikes of limestone that were pushed up subsequent to when they were, of course, all limestone was once under sea. Here it is, pushed up form, and uh, that Donta de Montmoyal, this is a village of Gigondas, by the way, you can see the uh, the limestone behind that, we'll see that in the photo of uh, Seguret as well, another spectacular village right behind the Dentelle de Montmirail. But uh, briefly, just on the Appalachian system here, again, to remind what you already know, uh, Côte du Rhône, if you look at the classic hierarchy, the pyramid uh, represents the base, the largest percentage of production, I think just under 50% of, uh, of the entire Rhône Valley. And there are some small little vineyards up in the north, but it is almost exclusively down in the south. Up in the north, there's just simply not any spare land, it's either one of the crew AOCs or it is, uh, it's pasture land or, or apricot orchards up in the top there. All right, so that's basic Cotillon, Cotillon village. Now we've stepped up. So not just anywhere in, in the Cotillon Appalachian, but from a number of specified communes, villages, quite a lot of them, quite a broad and vast area again. And then we get to really the, the section that we were going to be focusing on today, which is the Cotillon village with the addition of one of 22 geographic names. That's the, uh, the easier way to say it. The more technical term is a complementary uh, geographic designation, but who wants to say that? That's just too much of a mouthful. So it's just Cotillon village with a little plus, just like in Bourgogne, for example, you have Bourgogne Regional Appellation and then Bourgogne Vézelay, Bourgogne uh, Haute Côte de Nuit, Haute Côte de Bonne, et cetera, right? So, uh, the important point I want to make here is that the Appalachian regulations don't change from Cotillon Village to Cotillon Village plus a name. It's all part of the same bucket of uh, Appalachian regulations, if you will, but it does come from a much more specific geographic location. Everyone uh, clear with that? If you're not, throw some questions into the Q&A box or on the chat box. Sarah, can you just tell us briefly the difference between, say, Côte du Rhône Regional and Côte du Rhône Village AOC in terms of uh, the grape mix permitted, 
there's also difference in alcohol and, and har harvest times and that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah, so actually, I wanted to t say a couple things about this and about this hierarchy here. So the, the Cote du Rhone, obviously, the, um, the least restrictive of this hierarchy of appellations, followed by the Cote du Rhone village, which can be made up of about nine villages within the Cote du Rhone that do not have a, um, uh, let's say, a geographic name that can be used on their own in the label. And then you have the Cote du Rhone village, and the village uh, is quite important because um, these are villages that uh, that are associated and have been given a status and there are many of them. This is actually something that has changed quite a bit in recent times. When I was a kid and growing up in the area, um, there were a multitude of these villages that didn't exist, Sinarg and Fumerin and, and Mastif du Chaux and saint andéol and certainly Nyonce, which is a the newest crew. So there's actually been quite a bit of development in this category, the Cou du Rhône village. Um, so up to 22 now. And a lot of this really started with a, a real reinvigoration and re-energization that happened in the mid 2000s. So I'm really excited about this because I think it's a very dynamic category and it's moving in a great direction. Now, when you get up to the crew levels, here, um, a village doesn't necessarily always aim to become a cru, which I think is quite important. There are a lot of, of appellations, village appellations, um, whose producers don't have ambition to become a cru. Um, and that is because at that cru status, you have to drop using the name Cote du Rhône village from the label. So it, you know, it, it has to be a name that can stand alone without the association of Cote du Rhône village. And given um, the slightly lower restrictions, although they're quite high compared to Côte du Rhône and Côte du Rhône village, um, uh, without the geographic indicator, you, you're able to showcase that unique regional expression without having to force yourself up into the level of cru standalone, a lot more restrictive on, on producers in the area. So I think that Côte du Rhône village is a really, really happy place, as I said, quite dynamic and there's a lot of change within that area and evolution, which is great for those of us who enjoy wine. It's, it's perhaps, perhaps the most progressive of these appellations. And terrific point about the marketing aspect of having to go it alone with a village name that perhaps is, is not really well known outside of the region itself, whereas Côte du Rhône is something that is known, I would say, globally now. You and I, Sarah, have both been doing wine lists and, and reviewing wines for many, many years now, but you know, I never put together a wine program really without at least considering and, and very often including a Côte du Rhône or a Côte du Rhône village on the list for the very simple reason is that, uh, well, in a word, accessible accessible for price, accessible for the right. style as well. And we're going to be tasting a few of them. I'm sure everyone out there has tasted, but you know, these are very easy to love wines, very lovable. Uh, you know, I, I don't think I ever made an enemy in the business by pouring a Southern Rhone red blend or white or rosé for that matter. But let's, right. uh, let's just put it up there in different formats. So again, the regional AOCs are Côte Rhone or Côte Rhone Village or Côte Rhone Village plus one of those names. The crew are within the Côte du Rhône appellation itself, but now these singled out villages that were at one point, many of them in any case, part of the uh, Côte du Rhône village AOC. Uh, let's also not forget one important thing that the whole AOC system was born right here in the Southern Rhône. Those of you who studied your AOC history will know the name of Baron Leroy. He was a wine grower in Chateauneuf-du-Pape who decided that it was time to protect the valuable assets that they had down there and uh, drove forward and, and, and created the AOC system, which was then modeled uh, by the rest of, the, of uh, France and then again by the rest of the world as it rolled out um, and wine growing spread all over the place. So that is, uh, you know, this is where it all started. All right, and here's just some production terms. I mentioned already Côte du Rhône, about half of, uh, of the entire Rhône production. We're looking specifically at that 12% of production. And that's just it, you know, uh, <clears throat> I didn't mention it, but this is France's second largest wine region, 9% thereabouts of total wine production. So it is significant. You are going to encounter it. That's also one of the reasons why prices are accessible because there's a lot of wine and it's again, not easy to grow grapes here, but a little bit easier so that you can produce good quality wines at a reasonable cost, deliver them to the consumers and make a lot of people happy. 
And certainly within that level, there is a difference of concentration as well too between the Coterone, as you see here, uh, making up close to 50% of the product share to that of Cote du Rhone Village. And that does impact things. For example, in the Cote du Rhone uh, area, you've got, um, you've got you know, uh, 42 hectoliters is uh, per hectare is what you can produce. And then just slightly less in Cote du Rhone Village at 35 hectoliters. So certainly it, it reduces the yields there. And uh, one of the characteristics of these wines is slightly higher concentration. Absolutely. All right. Uh, <clears throat> just to give you a visual again, this is all in your encyclopedia, but the Cote du Rhone Village, 95 of those villages included in the overall appellation, and now 22 that can stick their name on the label as well. There they all are. We're not going to talk about all of them, just the ones that we're focusing on today. And you can see some of them are red wine only villages, some are all three colors, no white wine only villages, not surprisingly since this is overwhelmingly red wine country. And as Sarah was uh, just mentioning, this is a category in evolution. Nothing moves quickly in France and certainly not with the AOC system and the INAO, but uh, things do change. And you can see that there's been a progression of the, uh, the number of villages that are now included with most recently, for all of you about to take sommelier exams out there, Côte du village Nyons, brand new. Great we olives. had to change the slides during the course of this due to the announcement. So that's yeah. how new. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That must be a familiar sight to you, Sarah. Yes. Le Pont so, d'Avignon. So this is, I, I wanted to pause for a moment on this slide just to have like two minutes of anecdotes here. Now, this is, is the city of Avignon. And you can see the Pont d'Avignon here. Without the, the Rhone Valley, John, I and, and the Marquis de Sade, I might not actually have a career in wine, um, but certainly uh, wine and my father's research on the Marquis de Sade and de Sade was quite important in the Southern Rhone and the Hotel de Sade is still there. Um, and his chateau very nearby in the Luberon. Um, but, um, you know, there's, uh, this has been named now the capital of wine of the Rhone Valley. It is, if you look at your map, actually considerably far south in the Rhone Valley. Um, but there are a number of things that have happened over recent years. Um, one uh, one uh, hallmark here of the area is that uh, the Maison de Vin here, the, uh, uh, the offices of Interron are located in Avignon. And a number of years ago, uh, they established or producers established along with them um, uh, an institute uh, called the Carré du Palais, which is right across from the very famous Pope's Palace, which you can see here the Palais des Papes um, with the statue of Mary rising there, uh, the old Vatican and the old Vatican City, which was Avignon. Right across from there now you can visit some something called the Car Carré du Palais, where they have a vault of wines um, from every single appellation in the north and southern Rhone. You can eat there and uh, you can chat with sommeliers and help plan your trip to the Rhone, to the north and, and southern Rhone. Um, if you do that during the summer, you'll be there during the largest theater festival in the world, um, the Festival d'Avignon for the first time, I think, ever, it's had to have stopped because of uh, the coronavirus this year. Um, but um, thousands and thousands of people do come. The city triples in population and it's quite vibrant. So if you wanna catch a little bit of theater as well as maybe plan your trip up the Rhone Valley, uh, this, is, uh, this is where you do it. And quickly, the Pont Saint-Benézé. So we know of this as Sur le Pont d'Avignon and most of us know this song as a kid. But the story here is actually quite cute and or interesting. It's known um, uh, as known in France in Avignon as Saint Benezé, le Pont Saint Benezé, named after a um, a shepherd boy in the Ardèche who started hearing voices and was told to build a bridge across the Rhone. And this was the only bridge um, from Lyon to the Mediterranean actually across the Rhone. And there's good reason for that because the Rhone is very tumultuous and we're gonna see um, evidence of this and the wines to come and the galets roulés that go on and on and on on either side of the Rhone Valley that make up a lot of the important terroir in the South. 
But eventually a cardinal came and heard his story. They, they built a bridge. It got washed out many times. So perhaps it wasn't a voice from God, but um, the, uh, the, in the 17th century, it was abandoned. And that's what you see here, uh, a bridge that goes only halfway across the tumultuous Rhone. And there, you thought we'd only talk about wine. There's <laughs> so much more to discover in the Rhone. Yeah. And in the, yes, maybe not so safe to uh, dance on the Pont d'Avignon after all. Well, all right, let's uh, return from our digression. Let's get uh, into some wine. So uh, here is the list of wines. This is what you have in your kit, if you have in your kit. Hopefully, you've got something in your glass. And we are going to taste through these wines in order, starting with the Louis Bernard. And so for that, I'm going to invite Anthony Taylor from Gabriel Meffre, who, uh, who has the Louis Bernard brand, to come and actually tell us. Good morning or good afternoon, Anthony. You are joining us from nearby, again, in the Southern Rhone, correct? Correct. Hello, everyone. And, Hello. Your, and your English is impeccable, by the way. <laughs> Born in Morristown, New Jersey. <laughs> Brilliant. Great to have you. So before we get into the wine, what I'd like you to do, since Gabriel Meth is, is a sizable company making wines in many of the different crews, Couturon, Couturon Village, different villages, I think you're pretty well positioned to, if you could just give us a, a macro zoom on the, on the Couturon Village appellation in particular, uh, where you would look for some of the fresher wines, the more robust wines, powerful wines, your experience with the different uh, soil types, etc., etc. Certainly. That's Morristown, Jeff, by the way. Uh, now, for me, you know, I, I was, um, I'm American, but I was born in the U.S. and then moved, my family moved to France when I was three. And I've been in the Rhone Valley since uh, 1994, approximately. Um, and as you know, the Côte du Rhone village is, uh, you know, it's only in the southern Rhone. You don't get any Côte du Rhone villages in the northern Rhone. So it's, it's an important point because what it means is that Grenache is the is the primary grape of uh, that that is constructed around uh, to make a Cote d'Ivoire village. Um, in fact, I think there's a, there's there's a few wines coming in Cote d'Ivoire from the northern Rhone, but most most of the most of the Cote d'Ivoire and Cote d'Ivoire village are in the southern Rhone. Uh, there's a big break. Um, if when you're looking at the map here, most of the Cote d'Ivoire that you Cote d'Ivoire village, sorry, is uh, around the northeastern part of the southern Rhone, uh, where a, a, a big chunk of the uh, of, of the village Cote d'Ivoire and uh, and uh, terroir identified Cote d'Ivoire village come from, and the other portion is in the left, you know, lower uh, southwestern section, between Avignon and Costière de Nîmes. There's also some coming from, uh, you know, on the northwestern side around. Uh, Bagnol sur Cèze and Pont Saint Esprit. So, just I'm just going to say a couple of things that are important about Côte du Rhône village. Uh, in fact, in the whole Côte du Rhône village, as you know, is 12% of the uh, production. Okay, uh, of that 12%, most of that, almost 70%, is Côte du Rhône village identified with a with a with a, by a village, be it Sablé or Ségure or 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 Laudin or what have you. Um, and only about 30% is non-village identified Côte du Rhône village. So uh, I always thought, well, initially, I always thought that the, the villages were the were much smaller production versus the Côte du Rhône. I mean, the terroir identified was, was, was smaller, but in fact, it's much larger. Uh, so the wine that, um, the wine that I'm, I brought today is the, that we're tasting today is the Côte du Rhône village. Now, Louis Bernard, is a winery that physically existed in Orange um, up until about 2009. Uh, and then it was folded into our company. However, um, all the sourcing for, for Louis Bernard wines is separate and it's a separate winemaker. So the, the you know, the, the, I should say the identity of Louis Bernard is uh, still, still independent. That wine is what Louis Bernard is recognized for really. Um, you know, in the U.S., you can find Côte du Rhone, Côte du Rhone Village, and Chateauneuf for the most part. But the, the, the Louis Bernard Winery is recognized for the for the blend of Côte du Rhone Village. This is this is a classic Grenache Syrah blend. Uh, it changes every year; it varies a little bit, but it's between 60 and 40 
60 Grenache, 40 Syrah, or 65 Grenache, 35 Syrah. No oak here. This is, this is um, it's all done to focus on fruit. And it's really a great introductory uh, village, I think. Um, it's been very successful because it has, it's a step up from Cote d'Iron. It has a little more, you know, Cote d'Iron, there's a lot of primary fruit Cote d'Irons out there, whereas the village wines are, uh, you know, they're, they're getting into more complexity, a little more density, a little more spiciness. Um, great example to, as an introductory wine, um, to give you an idea, I think it's about 15, 16 bucks retail in the U.S. So um, we're going to be having some, the rest of the wines we're having afterwards are, um, you know, I, uh, terroir identified wines. Um, I, I would assume that... Uh, we're getting a little bit of feedback that there are some vineyards in this particular blend that are from one of those specific named villages, but you blend a few of them together yeah. so put it <laughs> under the general village. Sorry, I'm not going to ask you to name all of the villages. Sure. But... <laughs> I, I didn't send you. I didn't send you the the slides, unfortunately. So it's going to have to be a little imagination here. But um, the, the this is basically from two producers that we we purchased from are in the uh, on the western side of the Rhone Valley. One in the in the in the round Domazon, which is near between Avignon and Nîmes, which is in the southern part. I don't think it's um, that and then, um, yeah, it's well, you can see Signag, or it's around Signag, right okay. there. And then the other the other uh, source we get is up near Bagnol sur Cèze, which is up near um, Pont Saint Esprit. Okay, so these are both from the from the from the from the eastern from the Gas side. Okay, from the western side of the valley. And, and uh, just, just it's interesting because that section, particularly around Domazon, for example, is very much um, these are these are vineyards where it comes from. Now, uh, this is down near Domazon. It's very see, it's sort of very sandy, um, and and it's there's a lot of there's not so much rock or clay here. It's mostly it's mostly sand. Um, this is this is this shows you actually. There's this is a, a break where you can see this this sort of saf they call it. It's a it's a the Miocene sand, uh, sort of hard sand, and this is con constitutes a large part of the soil. So it, it makes it tend it tends to make a very, you know, the tannins tend to be soft. The uh, they're there, uh, but they tend to be riper and sort of smoother. Whereas with this, with a very, it's very good for the Grenache and and Syrah. And there's some vineyard there as well where you have you have you know you have you do have a surface layer of rocks, not the Galie size really. Get around chat enough, but you get sort of the, you know, the, remember that that most of these soils uh, below the below the, the the underneath is 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 sand. Then you move into gravel, and then you have the the rocks, the bigger rocks on the surface. That's that's the same thing as the, the principle of um, we call it. You know, uh -huh. when, you, when you put everything into a glass and shake it, all the big rocks go to the top. It's the same idea. <laughs> right. Well, uh, yeah. This is. Uh... Thank you for that description, by the way, and it really makes sense tasting the wine. I tasted this uh, earlier, made a few notes, and uh, was was trying to kind of uh, guess the the soil type, which is a fun game we like to play. But given the uh, the round, pretty voluptuous, soft nature, not as you say without tannin, but pretty ripe. I call them sort of furry tannins. Uh, I was guessing a little bit more of that sandy or that sandstone-based soil, which appears to be the, the case. The Bagnol sur Cèze vineyards are. <clears throat> A little, you know, the farther north, there's a little more clay and 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 limestone rock on the surface, but basically, it's a, a large portion comes around the Maison. And, and it's a 2018, which um, is a you'll we'll be tasting quite a few here. Um, is very lush. It's wonderful fruit in 2018, and that's why these wines, for example, this one in particular, is already immensely enjoyable at this stage, uh, which is you know, which is a bit of the trademark of the Côte d'Iron and sort of Côte d'Iron village uh, wines. Sarah, do you have any comments on this one? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, one of the things I love about this is that it really showcases Grenache very well here, um, aromatically speaking, as well as on the palate. I mean, this is just such a friendly grape, and it's very, very inviting. Um, and I think it's quite representative of Côte du Rhône village that um, that uh, you know might uh, have a kind of relaxed nature due to the red fruit and the almost sweetness of Grenache. And the neat thing is sometimes you can 
fool yourself into thinking that there's a little residual sugar in a Grenache based wine, but it really just has to do with the ripeness of the fruit and the generosity yeah. of this particular grape variety. Mm -hmm. um, so, so one of the reasons that makes it quite inviting, as well as the suppleness of it, the Syrah gives it just a little bit more structure. And I think, you know, that's where the, the structure in this particular wine is coming yeah, from. Exactly. Um, and texture. Um, so, you know, this is a great example of why these two varieties work so well together. Um, and it's, it's nicely showcased here. And, and a lot of us are exploring, and you know, I think you'll see it in the other wines, um, a lot of us are exploring blends that, because of the climate change and the, and the high sugar contents that the Grenache are achieving, um, there's obviously Syrah is on the, on the front runner because it tends to produce 1% alcohol less than Grenache, one to one and a half and brings more blue fruit, more spice. Um, and I think uh, we'll be seeing some of this in the wines we have tonight that, the, you know, for those of you who were around, you know, 20 years ago, um, a lot of Southern Roman wines tended to have a slightly oxidative, sort of very ripe, almost raisin character very often. Um, whereas today there's, there's, there's much more freshness. Um, and a big part of that, if I just have to slip this in, is what's made a big difference is temperature control in fermentation and a better understanding of vineyards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's allowed to make wines much more uh, fruit forward, fresh, less oxidative, um, and still have great concentration. So that's made a big difference. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a terrific point. I've, I've noticed there's been remarkably fresh wines, even from vintages like 2018, 2019, I think will also be another big, rich, lush vintage, but without that oxidized character of, of days of yore. So thank yeah. you so much for, uh, for that little overview. I know that uh, Maffle is doing some terrific things with sustainability. Maybe we'll leave that for the, uh, the after party. If anyone's got any questions about what is being done uh, you know, on the sustainable side of things, organic side of things, then Anthony is your man, one of your men, anyhow. And, and yes, worth absolutely. applauding um, Lou Bernard for, um, uh, for for beginning a, an organics line as well too. Um, that absolutely. is really well priced. So you know Bernard certainly the group is, is making an effort of sustainability on organic production. And it's growing. I mean village village appellation now I think is eleven percent uh, organic. The, all of the village we're looking at about eleven percent and growing. So it's uh, and like John says the climate here is lends itself to that which helps a lot. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Merci beaucoup. We'll see you uh, in a few moments. Yes. Enjoy, enjoy those wines. All right. Uh, we are going to shift into white and get on to the topic of the Cotillon village with a geographic name. In this case, that name is Sablé. So I'm going to bring in uh, Maud Autran from uh, the Domaine Piogier to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the village of Sablé uh, specifically, ah, and then also talk, if you could, Maud, about uh, your, your specific wine. Hi. Hello, Maude. Salut. Bonjour, vous m'entendez? You hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, I was not sure. So I am Maud. I am uh, from Domaine Piogier. I am the daughter of Jean-Marc and Sophie. They are the winemakers, and I am assisting them, uh, waiting to uh, take over the vineyards. So Sablé, it's a small appellation. We've been in this village for five generations. So that's my, I'm, I'm the fifth generation. And we are uh, making reds, whites, and rosés. And today we'll be presenting the whites. So the white for us represents a, a, a big part of our um, production. Uh, actually, we're making uh, about a third of our production with white wines. Um, to give you an idea, Sable, they make more over 10% of uh, white wine. And for us, it's more than a third our production, which represents uh, about 40,000 bottles, which is uh, quite a lot for us. So I'm very happy today to uh, present you the white wine. Um, so Sablé uh, white wine is made of four grapes varietals. So you have it, Grenache Blanc, Grenache Marsan, and Roussan. And the particularity of this wine is that we, we ferment it separately, so by a varietal and we, we fermented in barrels. So um, once we receive the grapes in the morning, we press it, we leave it in the, in the, um, uh, the press machine for about a day. And at night we'll, uh, we will press it um, and then put it in the barrel. So they'll ferment very slowly at low temperature 
and we will try to avoid uh, um, uh, malolactic fermentation to keep the uh, the acidity and we try also to keep this mineralty that we get from our soils from chevalon so chevalon it's uh, it's it's uh, in english called the long horse and we we have a, a very typical soil there um, it's uh, it's sandy but uh, it's sandy it's, in, it's on the hill side actually and it's sandy with limestone and you have a brown mouse so it's very particular and this is why we get uh, minerality even in the southern room which is kind of rare uh, to be honest but uh, we we are lucky to get this soil to our whites and to get to make this uh, this white wine so we'll keep uh, the wines the, the um, separately uh, by varietal about a year and just before the next harvest we'll blend everything together and we'll bottle the wine so currently you're tasting the 2018 2018 was a very um very weird year for us because we converted to uh, organic um in our farming it didn't change anything but uh but for organic we needed more tractors and actually to the the little story behind it is that we lost our production because our tractor uh didn't work at the time we needed to spray the the, the the vines so we lost a lot so we only made uh, white wine and red wine the sable the equivalent of the sable blanc but uh, in red so it's a very small production so i hope you enjoy it and then we'll move to 2019 uh, to give you uh, and i um a little of my background um the winery so it's five generation i'm the fifth starting to work with my parents and the, um, the person that started it, it was my great great grandfather. He had a little winery in the hillside, and every day he was going down to the main road trying to uh, sell his wine. And at the, at the end of his, uh, his life, he decided to build a winery where it is actually um, uh, right at the moment. This is where the winery is located, where my great great grandfather built the winery. And then his uh, son made wine, his great son made wine. And then my dad decided to bottle the wines. So before it, we were just uh, uh, selling to the wine merchants. And then my dad- and was, was white wine always a big part of your production mode? From At the, the time, no, it was only red wine. My, da my dad started making white um, because he was very curious about the Burgundy uh, whites. And he had a lot of uh, Grenache Blanc at the time, because people always think about Grenache uh, as red, but actually we have a lot of uh, white in the Southern Rhone Valley. So mainly people blend with the, the red, so you don't uh, see the difference. But when you say you have 100% uh, percent Grenache uh, wine, it can be Grenache Noir and Grenache Blanc blended. Mm. So. Then he was really interested in the Burgundy white wines. He had a, a nice um, barrels winery. So he said, okay, why not try, you know, uh, as an entrepreneur, trying something new, just not only uh, do what he knew, what to do, like the reds. So he decided to make the whites uh, like a Burgundy uh, way uh, with the fermentation in barrels. So he started, it was hard, but then he, he understood how to make it. It certainly and seems like uh, you've, you've got it all figured out because this is a really, really lovely wine. I was really, really impressed when I first tasted this for me is classic Southern Rhone white wine, if I could say such a thing with its uh, such beautiful creamy texture and uh, congratulations on the on the wood integration here. It's just not Thank a wine you. that stands Thank out you. for its wood. It's well, my dad a... is listening to you at the moment, so we will be very happy uh, Marvelous. <laughs> well, Mo, so thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for uh, for sharing this wine. I know it's a tiny quantity production. And uh, wow, we think of all the technical hazards of making wine. But you know what? Uh, a broken down tractor is not something that often crosses my mind as one of the things you need to worry about. But of course, that can make all the difference. Mm -hmm. so, Mo, we'll see you back uh, for the happy half hour. Keep some wine in your glass because uh, I might have some more questions for you. Sure. Merci. Thank you. Yeah. 
Sable wine, eh, Sarah? Yeah, it's a beautiful wine, and you. I think if you're going to be tasting Sable Blanc, uh, you know you have to you have to go to uh, Piaget because really, you know, historically speaking, this is an important property. They make, you know, quite a bit uh, compared to most producers here, um, and and even using oak to to age whites, which is not uh -huh. always common um in in the southern room not necessarily so uh so this is quite a lovely expression and it's also very nice to know that this is naturally most in a way naturally um uh, thinned or or, or the, the loads are quite quite low and speaking of that sable is actually one of the villages with the lower um uh, requirements for uh for for hectoliters yes. per hectare Max, yield. Maximum, yes. yeah they're down to about 32, which is lower than most of the villages. And a lot of this has to do, of course, with terroir. I mean, these are very sandy soils here, um, a little bit of red clay and gravel. So, you know, they're not conducive to high yields. Well, more on Sable in a moment, but uh, let's welcome Thibaut Brot from Maison Brot, who is joining us also from- Good Maison morning, all. Morning, afternoon. Tell us, Thibault, about uh, Laudin. We're now going to the other side of the Rhone. We're on the Rive Droite. We're on the right banks, because of course, then you look down. Yes, we are. We are right. Yes, we are on the right bank of the of the of the, of the Rhone River. And I'm first going to introduce myself and to introduce the the winery. So I am uh, Thibault Brot, uh, fifth generation at the Brot Winery in Chateauneuf du Pape. So as a family business, I work. Uh, very closely with my father, Laurent, and my mother, Christine. Uh, we own three estates, all of them located in the southern room. Uh, so we are like, uh, if I can say, specialized in Grenache winemaking. Uh, so one of the estate is located in Chateauneuf-du-Pape, another one in Caran, and another one in Côte du Rhône village, Laudin. Uh, we have like a, a passion, if I can say, for the great uh, Rhône Valley terroir. Uh, and for us, uh, Côte du Rhône village Laudin is, is one of those um, magic terrors. Uh, why? Because um, Laudin is located on the right bank of the Rhône River, and we don't have um, too many appellations in this part of the Rhône Valley. Uh, there, is a flesh, there is a fresher climate, and there is a mix of sandy and clay soils. And there is always more uh, rain uh, than on the left bank of the Rhone River. So the Appalachian Laudin uh, enables to produce really elegant and fresh wines. Um, loving this, uh, this style of wine, my father and my grandfather decided in 1999, 1991, sorry, uh, to acquire an estate called the Chateau de Bord. Uh, and today we're going to taste uh, a cuvee uh, from our winery, which is called uh, Bord Elegance. Um, and this cuvee is made of 70% uh, from uh, estate grapes and 30% from grapes that we buy, that we buy from suppliers. Uh, all the grapes are harvested by hand uh, at perfect uh, maturity. Um, well-drained sandy clay soils provide uh, a very nice freshness. Uh, we use a, a majority of Grenache. 70% of the blend is, uh, is from Grenache that macerates uh, from three to four weeks to get the maximum freeness and smoothness. And on the other side of the blend, we have 30% of Syrah that macerates uh, shortly to provide uh, tannins. Um, during this period of maceration, we do, um, in, in order to develop, in order to get more roundness and soft tannins, uh, we do what we call a pump over uh, every day. And we also do um, batonnage daily, clearings of the leaves uh, every two days. Um, at the winery, I mean, in, in the family, we don't like to use too many oak uh, in our wine. In, all of our wine. So um, what we do um, for this uh, for this cuvee is we use 30 percent. Uh, I mean, 30 percent of the blend has been aged in a uh, very old oak cask. Uh, some of them are century old, 
they have been bought by my great grandfather, and before that, they they uh, they were used for beer. So they are very old. This very old oak that do not give, do not bring any more hooky flavors, but that provides smoothness and length. And this is what we are uh, looking for. Um, for the other part of the blend, for the 70% left, we use um, classic stainless steel tank to, to reveal the, the fruit of the, of the blend. I love the result of the, of the wine. Uh, it's fresh, um, pretty smooth and elegant. And I think it's very accessible uh, and it can fit, uh, it can match with the different palettes, uh, different occasions and uh, different uh, generations. Um, right. Well, yeah, you know, we have a, a saying in the wine industry, save yeah. a tree, drink Riesling. But now we can probably add uh, Cote du Village to that as well, because there are so few <laughs> new barrels used down in this part of the world. <laughs> yeah. Gen generally old wood like uh, like you have here. I see you're getting some some new large casks to replenish your stock with the next vintage. But uh, yeah, these are wines that don't need that structure from wood. They certainly don't need the, the, the flavors of wood when you have such beautiful savoriness here. I have, I have one question for you because you make wine obviously in Chateau Neuf du Pape. Looking at Grenache specifically, do you notice a difference in acidity and pH levels from the Grenache in the Chateau Neuf du Pape terroir versus Laudin? I'm trying to understand what gives this wine its finesse, its uh, elegance. Uh, we have we have cooler temperature in Laudan. You know when you cross the when you cross the Rhone River, you always have one degree or two degrees Celsius uh, less than on the other side of the Rhone. You have more rain uh, during the during the year, and also I mean our seventy percent of the blend is coming from our estate, and our estate is located north of uh, Laudin AOC on the way to Bagnol. And we are on this, we are, look, we are, the, the vineyard is on a small mountain at uh, 100 and 120 meters elevation. So that's, I think, what brings the, the finesse and the, 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 the elegance of the wine. Brilliant. Well, uh, thank you so much for presenting this lovely Laudin on your list of, uh, of wines to save trees by drinking. We'll see you, uh, Thibault, in just a few moments uh, in the after party. Please rejoin us and uh, yeah, we'll have another glass Thank together. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Yeah, this Sarah, is comments? Certainly an interesting wine, and I'm glad we're tasting a, right, or a red wine, sorry, from Laudin, and maybe Thibault can comment on, uh, on the validity of the story. But um, I, I had heard last time I was in the Rhone that, uh, that the Laudin, Initially, when the crews were actually being established in the Southern Rhone, that there were going to be three initial crews established. One of them was Chateau Neuf-du-Pape for reds. One of them was Tavel for white, for, for rosé. And Laudin was to be the cru for white. But because producers didn't want to give up on reds, because they produce some really beautiful, elegant reds, like this one right here, that um, they didn't become a cru. And um, uh, our, 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 our village, or recognized village, and one of the earliest ones, right, in 67? I, I'm not aware about this story, but I know that today uh, they want to become. I mean, Lodin is applying at the Inao to become to become a, a new crew of the Rhone Valley, and they are uh, focusing on the white uh, to, to become one of the new crew of the of the of the Rhone Valley. They have the terroir to do it, and the 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 co-op of Lodin is uh, very important for the appellation, and they have uh, how can I say they have a very um, they have the, the best machines, the best technology to make uh, great whites. Mm. I'm just noticing the percentage of white production. That's uh, certainly one of the highest for any of the, of the village Definitely. geographic names, 20 or 20% white. Well, there we have more to look forward to, a crew uh, white Côte du Rhône. That'd be great. Okay, merci uh, Thibault. À tout à l'heure. Thank you very much. See you. Right, okay, uh, we don't have a winemaker for this next wine we're gonna taste. So go ahead, put it in your glass, give it a swirl and a taste. Sarah, I know you know a little bit about uh, this particular area, this particular named geographic place, Plan de Dieu. What is uh, the, the plain of God all about? 
right? So as the name suggests, this is actually a very large extended plain. So it's quite flat. Um, the only elevation is a really slight rise as it goes up in the uh, northeast to Viol and Jonquière, and then where it meets the Dentelle de Montmirail. And those Dentelles are named after the jagged tooth-like edges right on that limestone outcropping. So there is just a very, very gentle um, rise to that point. But basically, it's quite flat. And it's also very, very sunny. Now, it's an area that's getting more increased respect. Um, and, and certainly as a village. So it's, uh, it's one of the later villages to have been given, designated in, in 2005 here. And um, you'll notice that there is usually a, a pretty good percentage of Grenache, which is not uncommon, of course, in Southern Rome, but here in particular, uh, because you've got a lot of sunshine and heat. But given that it's a plain, you also get a lot of wind coming through here. So more than ever, you see, especially in this image here, the importance of planting low to the ground, right? And so there are a lot of um, untrellised vines or vines that are planted really low to the ground, oftentimes really just to, uh, to protect from that mistral that can come whipping through there on these plains. Ah, um, the mistral again, yes, indeed. Yes, once again. So we're, we're tasting this wine here from Ferraton, Père et Fils. Uh, you might be more familiar with their wines from the Northern Rhone. That's where the, uh, the estate's located. They make uh, Hermitage, Cross Hermitage, actually all of the crews of, of the north, and increasingly down here in the south, Chateau Neuf du Pape. And obviously this Clan de Dieu is uh, the one they make here, blend Grenache Syrah, Vauvelle, and we're seeing Carignan for the first time, a widely planted variety, more so uh, next door in the Languedoc, but a variety that I actually am quite fond of. I like the kind of wild and savage nature, certainly of old vine Carignan. And for me, this is a pretty, um, it's a pretty robust wine, uh, seeing that uh, photo of the, of the plain itself and imagining the heat, imagine that wind rushing through, desiccating the bunches to some degree, you get this kind of roasted, uh, I call it a uh, scorched earth character. Actually, that's not even my turn. It's the only wine tasting term I ever stole from Robert Parker. He used this scorched earth about Southern Rhone and I said that, that that fits here, you know, you get that. Maybe thinking flavor. exactly of this plane, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, apparently it used to be a forest full of bandits too. Is that, uh, is that story true? I had heard this story. See, once again, it needs to be verified. But um, yeah, roaming, roving bandits coming. And uh, certainly, I'm sure there was some great theft from these <laughs> wonderful vineyards, windswept <laughs> vineyards as well, too. So yes, um, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of this wine. I'm, uh, once again, you know, you can really smell that red fruit, uh, you know, slightly baked, but not overdone character. Um, mm. You can tell that the skins have had nice, a lot of sunshine. Um, and so you get a little bit of that, that character, especially figs as well, which is something planted quite readily in this area. Um, but uh, you can- Figs and black look. olives and all sorts of other savory Garrigue flavors. More on Garrigue in a second, but let's bring in Stéphane Vidot from- uh, from Tourbelaine and uh, bonjour Stéphane, Comme bonsoir. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for joining us. Now we've uh, gone right to the northern part of the Appalachian here, Valréas. So I want you to tell you tell us a little bit about this rather special village. Yes, uh, okay. So um, first of all, you mentioned La Ferme du Mont with uh, Tourbelaine and it's two different things. Uh, La Ferme du Mont is uh, it's an estate where I bought vineyards uh, for the last 25 years, uh, step by step, by small pieces of vineyards from Chateau du Pape, uh, Vagueras, and uh, recently Gigondas, uh, plus uh, Codurne Village on the Coudoule and, and nearby Violets. And uh, that was 25 years ago. And in 2010, uh, I was looking for some uh, terroir much more in the north with uh, a lower pH in the soil, with um, Easy process, natural process to, uh, to, to extract without to have too much alcohol. And um, I visited the, the region and I, I found the, 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 on, on the village, around the village of uh, Valreas, uh, some very, very interesting areas. So in Valreas, it's, um, you have different types of soil, of course. It depends if you are located around the village, you're more on, the, on, on clay and, uh, and sand. Uh, as we call uh, safre, uh, 
so we, which uh, used to give a lot of uh, delicate uh, touch uh, in the wine, uh, but at the same time, because uh, uh, the village of Valreas is located at uh, 270 meters, uh, and you know, for instance, that uh, Chateau du Pape is located at 100 meters. Um, so it's a big difference uh, in terms of expression. Uh, you, you have uh, uh, lavender around the village that you have not elsewhere when you go to the south. You change drast drastically of, of uh, species uh, of trees and, and, uh, and flowers and, and herbs in, um, in this area. And um, so the, when you start on the village, because the question was what kind of terroir you have, uh, clay and, and south and sand. And the more you go on the, on the mountain, on, on the top of the hills, and the more you, you, you meet uh, uh, limestone, uh, pebbles, uh, a lot of um, trees uh, and, and concretion of uh, stone with a compact soil, uh, not easy for, for the vine to, uh, to develop a lot of fruits. So um, most of the time, the more you go on the, on the, on the top of the, of the hill and on the with sp specific exposure, and the more you are, you will have naturally if you do not push the vine a very low yield, which will uh, give uh, even more interest in the concentration of the wine afterward, and uh, and that's it. Um, uh, Clobelan is um, uh, in this area. It's um, it's it's located on the top of the village. Uh, when you go on to the the highest. Um, small mountain, uh, you, you, you pass the, the top of it and on the east side, you have one big piece of land, which is uh, Belan, Clos Belan. And, uh, and of course, the, the interest here, it's, uh, it's a little bit crazy, to be honest, when I found that, because I tasted some juice, which was very surprising. Uh, in a way that uh, the red you have, uh, which is made half and half Grenache and Syrah, it, as, as uh, we, you were talking about pH uh, a few minutes ago, uh, here you are, you are roughly at 340, 342, 345, which is much lower than most of the, the, the white uh, when you go to the south of the southern Rhone. And of course, uh, we don't talk about um, necessarily the majority of the pH uh, of the rates that you can find when you do uh, 50 kilometers down the south. So um, when you have that, and which is very interesting, is uh, you, you, the best option is to work uh, organically for many reasons. Um, low pH means that uh, you, you, your soil is poor. So most of the time you have um, uh, or could I say, uh, not big problem with uh, weeds. Uh, you have, uh, you, naturally on the soil, you, you, if you work mechanically, you, you could be um, okay with no, you'll be not flooded by the weeds. And, um, and secondly, uh, when you have such a pore soil with such low pH, you don't want to uh, close your, the expression. You want to give life back to the to to the to the earth to the soil, so you you can introduce new new species of vegetal, uh, uh, and to 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 help the the vine to develop the roots down the soil, and to then to to give to maximum of complexity to the fruit. So once you know that, uh, you have a fantastic base to uh, to receive fruit with um, a perfect maturity on the very low yield. And the, 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 the beauty of, uh, of the clone is uh, that the cellar is uh, half buried in the hill. So you have a perfect uh, health and concentrated fruit that you can uh, deliver in each uh, small tank by the roof, by gravity. Um, and uh, that's, that's the beginning of the second step for, for Clobelan on this wine is that um, everything is respected. You have no, no uh, inoculated yeast, you have no sulfite and you don't need sulfite because on the terroir, on the highest elevation of the terroir of uh, Valrias, uh, with, with such a low pH, you can inhibit a lot of problem. So it's very self-protective. And um, then when you do that, 
and uh, you, you only have to uh, accompany the, the natural fermentation, which takes most of the time, depends on the vintage between uh, five weeks to seven, eight weeks, depends on the year, before going to the press, pressoir. Uh, and uh, very smooth process, but uh, it goes super, super slowly by inhibition of the fermentation with uh, no inoculated yeast. So it goes very smoothly. Um, the, the tannin are very dense, but very silky. Uh, you have a permanent freshness. You, you do not feel any obligation to, uh, to, uh, to over extract because you want to give a strength or power in the wine simply because it's super fresh naturally. I know that uh, it's, it's a great fashion to say that the wine is fresh, but here with a 3.4 pH wine, I tell you it's as fresh as summer. Uh, uh, southern Burgundian wine or sometime uh, northern part of Italy. I, I really appreciate that, Stefan. I mean, it, it's so fresh here. And um, you can also tell, you know, the darkness of this given the Syrah content. Have you, did you notice, um, notice more Syrah planted in this region than in other regions because of the, uh, because of the altitude and elevation here? Or yeah. is that you because your site is so high? Well, it's very interesting what you say because uh, when you're very when you're in the in the soft soft, uh, you want to have Syrah sometimes to to give a, a kind of uh, uh, density or complexity in the wine. Um, here in the, at, at Club Elan, uh, especially with the, the the type of Syrah which are planted in a vineyard, it comes from the, the roots that you find in the Northern Rhone Valley. And, uh, and it's really the purpose. The purpose is on, on, the, on the Serra here is not to deliver a, a jam of something right. dark and of super juicy that you can put easily in an oak. Uh, no, here it's to reveal the, 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 the pH of the, the limestone, um, the minerality a little bit. Uh, I try on the Serra here, uh, I try to look for the borderline of the reduction. Sounds, sounds like you covered all of the uh, the things I was hoping you would. I hope you didn't miss me. Sorry about that. I noticed never, you just popped off. Yeah. <laughs> never a dull moment in the world of Zoom. I have no idea what happened. I just got uh, bounced there. But thanks for letting me Thank back you. in. Uh, if I'm, thanks so much. I will certainly have some questions for you in the in the cocktail hour following this. But uh, we've got to move on because we're going to run out of time here. But uh, last word on this wine. Brilliant, really lovely, fresh. That's the first thing that struck me was the brightness of the color, the finesse of the tannins and the lively, lively acids. Really, really fine. Thank you. Yeah, merci. Merci. All right, so uh, I guess uh, Li Meng has taken over the PowerPoint. That's great, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, all right, so we're gonna taste this last wine here, which is, uh, well, we've got a video to play for you as well, but uh, let's talk about, there's, uh, this is the photo I want to, uh, to see there, the village of uh, Seguire, which uh, apparently in Provencal dialect means safe. And I imagine that uh, this would have been one of the safer places to be back in the day up off the plains on this gorgeous mountain, also known as one of the prettiest villages in, in France, I think. Is mm -hmm. there, would, you, would you agree? Definitely, definitely. And you can see how protected it is. And especially if you've got a lookout tower or one of those medieval castles during those times, it's really important to have that elevation, that lookout. But yet, yeah, absolutely gorgeous, nestled right there, um, the village uh, on the foot and, and the foot here of uh, this, this uh, hilly area. Um, but quite, quite beautiful, quite aromatic wines especially come from here. So who do yeah, we have speaking? It's a, it's a higher elevation uh, site. Yes. And uh, this, the soil story, well, you could see the photo there of the, of the mountain itself made out of that scalloped limestone, which uh, also brings finesse, as we just learned with the, with the previous one. Thanks for bringing that photo back. I could stare at that beautiful village all day. All right, let's, uh, let's taste the wine. When, well, you taste the wine. Let's bring in Alex Sutter, who uh, actually was born in, uh, born in England, but raised in South Africa. And his father managed the famous Rustenburg estate great producer in uh, in Stellenbosch so he was born into wine but then moved to moved to the Rhone and well fell in love as it as it were and ended up uh, sticking around he used to be a landscaper but now he's fully back in the business he wasn't able to join us but here is a word from Alex Sutter. My name is Alex Sutter and I'm speaking to you from Domain de Lamagine. 
where we farm 120 acres of vines in and around the picturesque village of Segure. I work alongside my wife Sabine and our daughter Mathilde, and the estate here was created by my father-in-law Jean-Pierre Verdot in 1968. With the arrival of Mathilde, we are undergoing quite a few changes, the most prominent being our decision to convert to organic farming methods, and our first fully organic vintage will be in 2024. Now what to say about the 2018 vintage? 2018 got to a very difficult start with an extremely wet spring, and this wet weather coupled with warm conditions meant that downy mildew was rife and difficult to control, as it was too wet and muddy to get into the vineyards. We managed to pull through with much hard work and many hours over time. Once we moved into summer, where it was hot and dry, almost drought-like, until some much needed rains at the end of summer, presented us finally with some great grapes with which to work. Credit must go to my daughter for the making of the vines that year, as I suffered an injury two days into the harvest and had to be hospitalized. Wines from the village of Segure are often summed up in one word, elegant, and our 2018 vintage is no exception to the rule. A dark red color with habitual hints of cassis and strawberries on the nose, soft silky tannins, and of course, much elegance. Our blend is a tried and tested one of 60% Syrah and 40% Grenache matured in cement vats. Cement vats allow us to maintain the soft flavor of the fruit, and as the French say, to let the terroir do the talking. We hope to enjoy the wines as much as we enjoy living and working in this idyllic spot. I'm on. Terrific. Let's just bring that slide back up here. All right, Domaine de Lamandine. Evan, I see you've uh, you've jumped on the screen. We're just going to wrap it up with the slide and then get to hopefully a couple of uh, questions. But uh, Sarah, do you agree with that? Finesse or elegance? Oh, definitely. And um, I know those sandy limestone slopes, I think, really give or, or contribute to that, that elegance. Um, I love how the tannins are so fine in this wine. And uh, the length is absolutely terrific here. Um, there is uh, you know, there's th something interesting, uh, uh, just a hint of bitterness, but um, I find that in the Southern Rhone, when you do have a little bit of bitterness in these wines, it really helps to balance out maybe a larger part of this wine or the, the generosity of the fruit. It acts almost like acidity. And I think this one shows very good balance because of it. Mm -hmm. Well, your bitterness is my almond or cherry pit like an amandine perhaps, but yeah, no, it's certainly, the, the French talk about that constantly, about the, uh, this noble bitterness that refreshes, brings the freshness where sometimes the city is lacking, although it's certainly not lacking here. Well, I think we should probably get to some uh, questions, Mr. Goldstein. Absolutely, if you wanna just, uh, actually you could probably unshare your screen at this point, because we're gonna open it up to Q&A. We have a, we have a few minutes and then we will uh, uh, drag whatever Q&A, and I'm sure there's a lot of it probably, Li Meng, over into yep. the happy half hour afterwards. Um, but before, just a preemptive thanks before I give you official thanks for that lovely guided tour of the village and geographical places of the, of the Couture and village. And Li Meng, let's curate some questions. Yeah, we don't have very much time. So I'm going to ask Maud if you could come on a uh, video. We have two questions that I'm going to lob first to you. The first question, Maud, is um, whether or not you have your uh, Blanc, if your wine was actually aged in new barrels at all. Um, can you say it again, please? Is, I don't, I'm is not your, sure. Can you hear is me? Your, yes. Yes. Is your, so what is, was your question? Sorry. The, the question is, is the white wine, is I your Blanc? I don't hear you. Oh. Um, do you, do, does everybody else hear me? We can we can hear you yes. Okay. I think it was I think my computer is old and I I, I was not sure I could hear no you. Or I so hear you. you. If I had a new oak. Yes, if there's new oak in the uh, your uh, your white wine. So uh, basically no, um, we can we try to renew the barrels uh, every year, but it depends what we buy for the reds. Uh, you know, question of budget. But uh, usually we have one or two new barrels for white every two years. Uh, and we have about 40 barrels for the whites. Great, thank you. So um, the, the new proportion is really low. 
Wonderful. Uh, there was another question for Maud from Natalia and Brandon. It is answered. So for those of you who are looking at Q&As, there is an open section and an answer section. And a lot of our lovely Roan panelists have been answering those questions. I'm going to lob the next question. Thank you so much, Maud. I'm going to lob the next question um, to you, uh, um, John. Uh, from Jeff, are there any producers in the region that are producing 100% varietal wines outside of the AOC classification? And I don't know if there are any other producers, Anthony or others, who might want to join John in answering that question. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Obviously, it would have to be outside of the AOC because by law, it has to be a blend with minimum percentages. We all know that. Off the top of my head, 100% from the Southern Rhone. Um, you want me to uh, give you a hand on yeah. that, John? Please, please jump in. Yeah. Okay. I was. I tried to answer that, but I hit the microphone uh, response rather than the hitting the typing response. So, uh, yes. Zoom. To answer the question, there are both in AOP uh, regulation. I mean, there are producers producing single vineyard, uh, single variety wines, not necessarily completely lined up with. Um, you know, with the regulations, but bear in mind that regulations are quite complicated. Often the restrictions uh, to, to grape varieties uh, are pertain to the, what you have in the vineyard, not necessarily what the blend contains. This is a very important point <laughs> because it actually changes quite a lot. It gives people a lot of flexibility to make wines with higher percentages or less percentages than actually what, what one thinks the appellation requires because it's mostly what you have planted, not necessarily what's in the blend. Uh, so in the AOP, there are people doing single, uh, often very, Grenache, for example, is a good example. There's quite a few, even in Chateauneuf, doing 100% Grenache. Um, there's, there's, there's a few doing single uh, Syrahs and actually these are saint -Sos, which are, uh, uh, you can find single single varietal Sansos as well. But yes, Van de France has given flexibility to the potential to use, uh, to produce single varietal wines within a terroir that may be part of the appellation, but not 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 identified as such on the label. I could jump in for one one question. Um, uh, well, I yeah, it's just, if I can, yeah. if I may. Please, Mark, go um, ahead. It's about this uh, single vineyard. Uh, Variety. Variety. We we actually do a lot of uh, single uh, single grape varietal like uh, from the Rhone Valley. So we are about to launch a hundred percent Grenache Blanc. We have a hundred percent Viognier, and we also do a um, hundred percent Syrah and a hundred percent Cunoise. So I don't know if you ever heard about this uh, grape varietal, which is from the Southern Rhone. And uh, so to answer your question. Uh, we try to develop this um, terroir um, by one grape. So yeah, this is- uh, and Those would be under the, uh, under the Vin de France appellation. Well, we don't do it uh, because we consider it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a grape from the Rhone Valley. From now, we, we, the production is so small, we, we didn't have to put it in Vin de France. If it grows, we may have to. Mm -hmm. I would yeah, I also think the add... question. Yeah, I think the question is 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 do, is it labeled or bottled as such, uh, as a single? I mean, is it bottled? No, uh, we bottle as it as a, a name of vineyard, and our uh, clientele know it's uh, know us, and they know it's a hundred percent of Pinois, but right. we don't mention it in the in the in the um, in the label. I, I would I would add finally maybe as a, a close to this we can address a question one more question before we move to that a lot of it i remember it's like when i went to um to tuscany the first time was it a chianti producer oftentimes they'll look at you and you sort of say do you make this or is this like that and then they'll look at you and like they'll go who's asking like they have a different answer for everybody i know for a fact there's producers i visited in the rhone valley that'll tell you on the record this off the record that, and it might be because some things, the percentages are incorrect <laughs> or a variety is planted where it's not really supposed to be used. So the answer is, of course, they're going to be. The second question is gonna be how much trust do they have in you to keep a secret if they actually tell you or not, because they can get in a hell of a lot of trouble if, uh, if, the, if the wrong person knows. But I think that's true anywhere in the world where you have restrictions and regulations. But in terms of the legalities, what Tony said, what Mud said, what John said. 
I'm going to, we're going to go over another two minutes because I've got two questions. So if the panelists can help me out by answering really quickly, and then we'll join everybody in the happy hour. Um, I just want to point out to everybody who is thinking about going to happy hour, the information for the happy hour, it's on the Thinkific platform, but Andrea has made it very simple for you as well. If you want to just take this down, um, the link is also available here for you to go to happy hour. We're just going to answer two questions. The first question, uh, this is a difficult one for me, so I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, I'm going to read it off. Why were none of the grapes from Southern Rhone utilized in the recent addendum to the makeup of Bordeaux? Why not keep it in the family of France? <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm going to answer that one because uh, I'm sure there's a whole can of worms behind it. I don't know the the inner discussions that took place behind closed doors at the, in the Bordeaux region. I don't know, Sarah. Do you know any any details? You know what? I I would pull, ask one of the producers if they have some information about it because I can think of a few things to say, but I'm not entirely <laughs> sure that it's really a or on message. So maybe. Um, the only grape that I would know, and I defer to the producers, is Marcelon, of course, which, uh, you know, is legally planted now in Bordeaux and is also obviously a very small part uh, of the Rhone Valley, but that's, uh, I defer after that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's, you know, with decisions like that, it's quite political. Um, I, I'm only assuming, <clears throat> I'm only assuming that the fact that none of them were, well, other than Marcelon, maybe none of them were brought in was, could be because of regional identity sort of not to not to step on grapes from another region uh, but yeah I, I that's it is a bit of a mysterious question um, the I, fact I that, uh, that. yeah go ahead that's one of those varieties I don't think would be suitable in in the Bordeaux climate in Terroir. You know, it's it's a lot wetter. It's more than, humid. Yeah. It's much more humid. Grenache is a pretty thin skinned variety. It needs a lot more heat than yeah. And Mourvedre, same thing. Syrah yeah. might be an outsider. You know, even Sasso is a fairly late ripener, no? In the, or, or, or lighter. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I, I think that we have one question that Daphne wanted me to ask. I think we'll take it in the happy hour. Anthony and Maud, if you guys can join us in the happy hour, the link again is in the chat. Evan, I'm going to just skip over because we're losing people as we talk here. Um, mm -hmm. The next session that we have is going to be on Tuesday. Um, we highly encourage everyone to join us for this. Um, and it's going to be an oxygen discussion. So it's going to be a really cool discussion. And for those of you who joined our very first session and got a bottle of the, um, the wine from Irie, uh, this is going to be a second time that we're going to be drinking from that same bottle using repours. So again, um, Evan, I'm just going to skip ahead and go to the happy hour. I hope to see most of you there um, at the Big happy thank hour. Thank you to all of the winemakers, to Enteron, to Sarah and John for uh, taking Sabine. us through this amazing tour. We'll see everybody on the other side.